Alrighty, so deploying a disaster recovery site on AWS, that's what we're here to talk about, uh, BAC 304. So this is a 300 level session. We're not gonna go too technically into the, into the weeds, we're not gonna go into code and um, any live demos. There is BAC 404, which is a session after this, and I'll give you the details on that, where um, one of my associates, uh, Kamal and Vikram, uh, too actually, are gonna be doing a live demonstration of migrating from one AWS site to another AWS site. So uh, you guys get to actually go in and do a survey survey and we migrate the data across. Uh, with this, we're going to go through the uh, general best practices and um, architectures around disaster recovery with AWS. So once again, for those of you who uh, just turned up, I'm Matt Lewis. I'm a solution architect for AWS. And I've also got Ravi here from App Associates. Ravi's here. Um, he's going to pre present a customer use case. So what we're going to cover disaster recovery and business continuity and how those two go hand in hand. Uh, then why AWS for disaster recovery? So why would you choose to use Amazon Web Services for your uh, disaster recovery site? Then we're gonna cover common disaster, disaster recovery architectures. So the four main uh, ones that you see here up on the screen, backup and restore, pilot light, warm standby, and multi-site. Is everyone familiar with these four? Just a show of hands who, who have heard of a pilot light or a warm site. Okay, so we've got, we got a fair, fair few hands here. Okay, good, good, good. Um, so this session has actually been running for, uh, last year at reInvent and then also again at the, uh, at the summit. So it was very popular then and it's very popular now as you can see from the people here today. So um, we're, gonna, we're gonna go through those and give you guys a bit more of a, an idea on how to um, use AWS for DR. Then we're also gonna go through a customer use case. It's a pilot light use case. So a real live um, architecture that was deployed on AWS um, from from one of our customers and Ravi's gonna cover that. Then we'll go through where to go to next for more information. Okay, so let's talk about disrupt disruptions to business continuity. So these days, IT infrastructure is extremely important. Um, basically, if your IT infrastructure goes down, you lose business continuity, okay? I mean, that may have not been the case 50 years ago, but these days it definitely is. Um, and that also affects uh, businesses of all shapes and sizes. So not just large enterprises, service providers, also small businesses. Let's say a small file server in a closet somewhere goes down um, in a real, real estate office, for example. Um, that does disrupt uh, business continuity. Also, disruptions can be very costly. Right? If your main IT systems are down, your staff aren't working, you're losing data, that's gonna cost you um, dollars. So let's talk about what causes downtime. Just um, a quick show of hands, who's ever experienced a major outage um, with their IT infrastructure, for example, um, and they haven't been able to do their day-to-day their -day job? Okay, a couple of hands. All right, almost everyone. All right, excellent. So what causes downtime? Well, natural disasters is what comes to mind for me, actually. I live in San Francisco, I live in the Bay Area, and I get told by a lot of customers that San Francisco is gonna slide off into the ocean. Whether that actually happens or not, I don't know. Um, we had Hurricane Sandy a few years back. Um, that did take out a lot of data centers in, in the New York region on, on the East Coast. Data centers were flooded. So when you're thinking about a data center or a primary site, you often think about disaster recovery and natural disasters that, that can cause those outages. But in fact, that's one of the smallest um, attributing factors to outages. Next, we have security incidents. So let's just say your site is compromised. Obviously the site's gonna be taken down. You can mitigate security incidences, of course, um, but that does also cause downtime for your, for your infrastructure. The next we have here is um, equipment failure. So one of the most famous quotes from Werner Vogels is everything fails all the time. Okay, physical hardware does fail. Servers in a broom closet do overheat and fail. Hard drives fail. I mean, we have hard drives that fail uh, all the time. Data centers have hard drives that fail all the time. Physical equipment does fail, and that causes downtime. Human error. Now, you may not think about human error too much. You may uh, go to bed at night thinking about the next natural disaster, but human error is, in fact, one of the leading causes of uh, outages or disruptions to business continuity. So according to the Acronis Global Disaster Recovery Index of 2012, I wish I had one for 2014, that would have been nicer, but um, the most common cause of outages is human um, error and sitting at 60%. So 60% of outages are caused by um, a slip of the finger on a keyboard or someone tripping over a cable. Um, 
I did have a story I used yesterday in the APN um, summit that we had. Uh, one of our engineers once in a data center wasn't allowed to lift the floors in the data center to run new fiber. So he actually got an umbrella and slid it underneath the flooring. As he pulled the umbrella through to, to pull the fiber through, he pulled about 10 fibers out. So that caused an outage. Now, if the human factor wasn't involved there, would those servers still be online? Of course they would. Okay, so let's talk about some key terms when it comes to disaster recovery. And this has nothing to do with AWS. Well, it does have every, everything to do with AWS, but um, these terms have been around long before AWS. So recovery time objective. Recovery time objective is the time the system can be down before you suffer a significant impact. So the time or the tolerance that you can um, not have access to that system. And we call that RTO. RPO or recovery point objective is the amount of data that you can afford to lose. Okay, so recovery time objective is in minutes, hours, days. Recovery point objective is generally in minutes, hours, days of data being replicated to a database, for example, or amount of files that you've lost if a hard drive dies. Um, so these two terms are very important, RTO and RPO. Now the third uh, factor that really comes into play uh, when it comes to disaster recovery and planning for disaster, or planning your disaster recovery uh, plan, is money. Okay, so dollars are the third factor. And if you spend more money, you can uh, decrease your time of the, the time of the outage and the amount of data lost. And if you uh, decrease or you don't want to spend as much, obviously your time to recover your RTO and your data loss is going to increase. So it depends on how much you're willing to spend on your disaster recovery data center or, or your DR plan. Okay, so let's talk about conventional disaster recovery sites. Traditionally, they're high cost and low return on investment. So what does that mean? High cost, if you have a data center that you've deployed, it's cost $5 million or $4 million, for example. If you want a secondary data center that mirrors that exact workload, you need to spend another $4 million or another $5 million. Okay, so you're spending twice the capital expenditure. How often do you actually use that secondary site? 10% of the time, 5% of the time, never. It's a pretty bad return on investment. And usually because of this, it's only implemented for the most critical systems. Okay, so if you're looking at your um, critical data that's very important to your business, you're generally going to back that up. Okay, you're not going to back up your um, payroll on a, on a minutely basis. Okay, you're probably going to do that on a, on a daily basis. Okay, and usually because um, of the cost of a secondary site in a, in a DR scenario, um, the sites are generally scaled down to 50% of the full capacity of the primary site. Now, what's the reason behind that? Uh, well, basically, um, businesses feel like they can still operate at a reduced rate. Okay, a complete outage may not be acceptable, but operating at 50% of their, their capacity might be acceptable until they can get the primary site back up and working again. That's still $2 million on a $4 million investment. Uh, if your primary is $4 million, you're spending $2 million on your secondary. Also, uh, software licenses. You pay for software licenses on servers that are deployed. Whether you're using those servers or not, you're still paying for the licenses. Another point here, systems in a remote region can be challenging. Generally, if you're on the east coast of, of the United States, you've got your technical staff there on the east coast with you. If you deploy another site on the west coast, you need to generally fly those guys out there to do the implementation of the secondary site. Okay, so it's not generally where your uh, point of business is and where your expertise are. So that can be costly and challenging as well. All right, so disaster recovery on AWS. So AWS, we're, we're um, not that old of a company, uh, deployed or, or launched in about 2006, so we're pretty, uh, we've been in the cloud computing game quite, quite a while now, but um, the capability that we bring to DR is just uh, amazing, and we'll jump through the solutions that weren't possible prior to AWS. So we do have unprecedented capacity to implement DR sites in AWS. The ability, the main factor or the main benefit that you get from AWS is the ability to scale up resources and scale down resources. Or if you're thinking about scaling out instances, number of instances, the ability to scale out and scale in. Think about that from a DR capacity. If you can scale out in a matter of minutes, then why can't you scale up when you've got a failure and scale down when you don't have a failure anymore? So that's where AWS really brings the benefits to the table as far as disaster recovery goes. So you can cut down on your DR costs. I mean, we've got up to 70%, but if you think about the secondary site that we were doubling our costs from the primary site, now you, you can scale that when you need it. You're obviously not paying for it for that 100% of the time. You're paying for it for 10% of the time. 
So there's substantial savings there. Software licensing as well. You're obviously paying for those software licenses as you need them, okay? Not when you actually buy them from, from that point forward. Another benefit of AWS, global reach. We recently launched our Frankfurt region. We're up to 11 regions now. If you wanted to uh, deploy, as I said earlier, it is challenging to deploy in a remote location for your DR site. With AWS, from the click of a button, you can deploy from, from one region to another. Using something called CloudFormation, which I'll touch on in a second, you can deploy your infrastructure in 11 regions, if you like, without actually having to fly uh, expertise to those regions. You can do it all remotely from, from where, your, um, where your office is located and where your experts are located. Okay, so some of the tools for implementing disaster recovery on AWS. We have AWS CloudFormation. Just a show of hands who's used CloudFormation before. Okay, fair number, that's good. So CloudFormation is basically a way of having infrastructure as code. So what that means is you define the infrastructure that you're deploying in AWS in a JSON template. So the template has all of the attributes that make up your infrastructure. You can upload that template into AWS and deploy your infrastructure in a matter of minutes. If you wanted to take that CloudFormation template and deploy it in Oregon, sure. If you wanted to take that same template and then go and deploy it in Frankfurt, our new region, you wanted to have a DR site in Germany, you can absolutely do that. Also, we have what's called AMIs, or Amazon Machine Images. For those of you who are familiar with um, images of hard drives, think of, a, think of a ghost image, it's the same kind of thing. So you can take a snapshot of your built infrastructure at that point in time and redeploy it out as you need it. So the beauty there is you create an AMI of a working infrastructure, you shut down the working infrastructure, and then you can redeploy that infrastructure using those AMIs at any time. We also have cross-region uh, EBS uh, snapshots. So you can copy um, elastic uh, block storage or drives, basically images of drives from one region to another. You can do cross-region uh, read replicas for MySQL. Does anyone here know what a read replica is for, for a database? Should have a fair few hands here. Okay, so basically it's a, a copy of your database which is used for reads, and that can be promoted to the master database at any stage. Okay, we also have Amazon Route 53 and auto-scaling, so I manage DNS service. I'll talk on that when we go through the architectures themselves. Auto-scaling is a great feature as well, so the ability to react to a, an event within AWS and scale out resources. When you're not using resources, you're in bed, it's 3 a.m. You don't want to go and um, shut down servers in a data center somewhere. Auto-scaling can do that automatically for you. Okay, so very powerful uh, features there. We have EC2 reserved instances too, so you can save costs on that. Um, a um, heavy utilized um, reserved instance can save you about 70% of what the on-demand pricing is. I like uh, doing a couple of polls just to get a feel for, for whoever out, uh, the guys, that are, guys and girls that are out there, but who's using reserved instances today? Okay, I'd like to see more hands because you can save a lot of money using reserved instances. Okay, storage options. We have a lot of storage options in AWS. So the three main uh, storage options that come to mind here are Amazon Elastic Block Store. So I did just talk about that. Basically, think of it like a drive, drive attached to an instance. Okay, we also have Amazon Simple Storage Service, so our object storage. We have literally trillions of um, objects stored in uh, Amazon S3. And a key point here is that we have 11 nines of durability. I'm sure you've all heard that figure before. If not, 11 nines is, is a pretty hefty durability feature or uh, figure. We also have Amazon Glacier, which is our archival um, storage. Amazon Glacier doesn't really come into play too much when we're talking about DR. It is for, more for archival and, and our backup, certainly. But um, uh, we won't be talking about Amazon Glacier too much. Okay, so now we're going to talk about the common disaster recovery architectures. So the four key um, architectures that, that um, we've got here are backup and restore, pilot light, warm standby, and multi-site. So each architecture differs from our three um, key values. Remember RTO, our time to recover, RPO, our data loss that we can sustain, and cost. So each solution is more expensive or less expensive than the others, and each solution has a different RTO and RPO. So depending on what your disaster recovery needs or your application's needs are, um, you can deploy one of each, of each of these four. Okay, so let's start with backup and restore. This is probably the simplest. It's easy to get started. So there's a very low uh, technical barrier of entry. It's also the lowest cost. 
Let's talk about what it looks like in, in AWS. Now, I wanted to actually have a progression slide here, but we've got the one, so you'll have to bear with me. But basically, we've got our on-premise data center there on the left-hand side. I think we, oh, we do have a laser pointer. Okay, awesome. And um, what we've got on the right-hand side is our AWS infrastructure. So for those of you over, over this side, the AWS infrastructure on the right-hand side here. Now, we are um, backing up the database into Amazon S3. Now, that could be an hourly backup. It could be a daily backup. It could be a monthly backup. Depending on what your RPO is, how much data do you want to lose? The last month's worth of data? Sure. Back it up every month. Probably not, though, generally. Then uh, we have the instances running in AWS. So we've got the web server, app server, and database server replicated, just the same as what we do have on our, in our corporate data center. However, in general terms, uh, under a normal scenario, these servers aren't actually running. So what you'll do is build your infrastructure in AWS, create AMIs, create snapshots of your EBS volumes, and then shut the servers down or even delete them. So when you do have an outage, you can see here we've got Route 53 uh, up the top here for DNS resolution. For those of you over here in the top of the screen, you can use uh, Route 53 to send your users to your AWS site. Now, under an, during an outage, your corporate data center has gone down. You will use your AMIs, snapshots, to build your infrastructure. So you might have a CloudFormation template that you will launch and deploy. That CloudFormation template will reference AMIs, will reference snapshots, and deploy your infrastructure. You'll then back up from your database backup within S3, you will restore the database information. So over here, we'll restore the um, data from your, um, sorry Ravi, I don't want to get you here with the laser. <laughs> um, you'll restore from your S3 database backup. This has the longest RPO out of all four solutions, and, but it also has the least cost. Okay. Now just a quick word on Amazon machine images because I want to talk about the marketplace as well. But AMIs, um, you can basically build your own AMIs. So you build your own stack. You've got a web server, it's an Apache server. You've got your own version or you're, you're doing so something custom on it or it may be completely standard. Um, you can build your own AMIs from your EC2 instances. So once you've built that infrastructure, you take an image and store the AMIs within your account. We also have what's called the AWS Marketplace. So the link here is aws.amazon.com slash marketplace. Anyone use the marketplace before? OK, cool. We have a lot of enterprise grade software and other vendors um, at, the, at the marketplace that you can deploy on a pay-as-you-go um, basis. For example, if you wanted an F5 load balancer, you can deploy one from the marketplace. There's a whole lot of other, other software on this. There's Semantic. Um, I, I don't want to mention too many names because I don't want to favor any one over the other, but there's a lot of software. I think there's over 1,600 different um, uh, types of software and categories in the AWS marketplace. So if you didn't want to build your own AMIs, you could use the marketplace. OK, so there's many ways to back up. You could use. Um, uh, just a pure internet connection into S3. You could have a secure internet connection, so S3 does support encryption. You could use AWS Import Export or AWS Storage Gateway. So Import Export is if you want to uh, package up your drives and send them to us. There's actually a, um, a saying that still rings true today that FedEx has more bandwidth than the internet. So if you have 54 petabytes of data and want to send it to us, that's going to take a long time over a, even a one gig pipe. AWS um, Storage Gateway. So we have um, what is basically an instance you can run or a virtual machine you can run in your environment, and it has WAN optimization, et cetera, and basically enables an iSCSI mount within the AWS infrastructure that you can um, use to back up your data into or get your data into AWS. We also have AWS Direct Connect. So if you did want high bandwidth links into a, an Amazon region, you can use Direct Connect. So Direct Connect is basically physical fibers that you can have provisioned into our co-location facility where we have um, routers connected back to our um, regions. Also, you will notice here um, on the bottom right of the slide, we can back up our AMIs and our EBS snapshots from, from AWS. So over here on the, on the right-hand side. OK, so some considerations about uh, backup and restore. You really want to make sure that your AMIs are current. Now, this is um, also an argument that you'll talk to about people about um, pre-building your AMIs or bootstrapping your AMIs. So um, if you're pre-building your AMIs, you're basically loading the software onto an EC2 instance and taking a snapshot of it, or taking an AMI image or creating an image of that. 
Now you do need, that takes a lot of work when you first do build the images, but then when um, you deploy, it's quite easy. It's very fast to deploy because all your software's already installed, it's already up to date, but you do need to spin up that AMI occasionally, update and create a new image. Now, if you were bootstrapping, you could use something like Chef or Puppet, and it doesn't really matter which one. Um, and you could use that to basically bootstrap or load the software on when the images come up. Now, that does, does take a little bit longer, but you will then be loading the latest software on those, on those images when you do deploy them. Okay, so you could also uh, use CloudFormation. I can't really uh, speak high enough about, uh, or highly enough about CloudFormation. It's so easy to deploy new infrastructure. We have something called Cloudformer as well. If you have manually built infrastructure, for me personally, um, it takes about 40 minutes to spin up a, a VPC and multiple subnets, multiple EC2 instances. Um, even then, you know, you've got to wait for the instances to come up. With a CloudFormation template, all of that's already defined. You just upload the CloudFormation template and run it. Um, we do also have what's called Cloudformer. So if you've built by hand through the console a AWS infrastructure, you can use CloudFormer to create a CloudFormation template. Okay, so quite powerful. People tell me, hey, I've got my production environment running on AWS, I don't know how to test on that. Why not use CloudFormer to create a CloudFormation template, redeploy your production environment as a test or dev environment in AWS in another VPC. Right, some pretty powerful stuff there. Also consider light utilization uh, reserved instances um, when you're using backup and recovery. So if you're running instances for more than a certain amount of time, it does make sense to use RIs. And test your DR plan frequently. I can't stress that enough. All right, let's talk about pilot light. This is probably my favorite and the most interesting of, of these scenarios because it's not something that you can do in a traditional data center or it's something that's quite hard to do in a traditional bare metal um, data center. So basically what you're doing is you're building resources around your replicated data sets. So your databases, okay? Now um, you scale resources as you need them, right? So if you have a DR event, you scale up the resources that you need. But first you wanna have the data sitting in AWS so it's there and ready to go. So as far as this solution goes, it does cost more than backup and restore, but you do get a much better RPO slash RTO, so a lower time to uh, recover and less data loss because you are replicating. Let's have a look at what it looks like. Okay, so we've got our pilot-like architecture here. We've got our example.com using Route 53. We're sending all traffic to the primary site. We're also replicating from the data center from the primary site over to, a, uh, sorry, the uh, database in the primary site to a database within AWS. Now you'll notice here the EC2 image might be a little bit smaller. Sometimes it would be the same uh, size as your deployment in, in your on-premise. But basically you're copying all of the data from the database and replicating it into AWS so your important data is already there. How often does data change on an app server? How often does data change on a web server? It shouldn't. It should be an image that you deploy and it's the same image every time. Okay? You shouldn't be storing images on a web server. A web server can disappear. So that's where we take advantage of, of that with the pilot light architecture. So under failure, you can see that now we have, we still have our AMIs and our, our um, images, our EBS snapshots in S3. So over here for, for the folks over here. And what we're doing under failure is we're using cloud formation or auto scaling, et cetera, to spin up our app servers, and data, uh, app servers and web servers. You'll also notice from our previous one, it's a bit hard to see, um, we've scaled up the database. So this database is now becoming a master database. So it's doing all of the reads and writes, okay? So with pilot light, uh, the saying actually comes from a pilot light in a stove. There's always something running in the stove. There's a flame in the stove ready to ignite the, the stove as it needs to, as opposed to having to light the stove completely cold, which can take a long time. So this is a great combination of cost saving, because you're only paying for the database, and also having a great RPO and RTO, so time to recover and minimal data loss. Okay. So activating a pilot light disaster recovery site, you would use AWS CloudFormation and auto scaling to, to stage your infrastructure. Um, keep your AMIs or bootstrapping scripts current. So as I talked about with um, your disaster recovery, or sorry, your backup and restore, you wanna make sure your AMIs are current. That does take uh, work, either you wanna bootstrap on boot up or build them out every time you need to do an update, et cetera. Leverage EC2 heavy utilization reserved instances for the database. 
That's quite important. The database is running all the time, 100% of the time. Right? With a reserved instance RI for three years, if you did on-demand pricing or you did use an RI um, reserved instance, a heavy utilization reserved instance, the heavy utilization reserved instance is basically paying for itself within three months because of the cost savings that you have there. Okay, so you can save a lot of money. People say, oh, I might only want to run it for six months. Well, three months it would have paid for itself. So RIs are really, really important. And test your DR plan frequently. So in this case, it's actually quite easy to migrate from your on-premise data center over on into your secondary site. Okay, Route 53 does have the capability to monitor instances and change your um, C name redirection as is required. So Route 53 up here could be monitoring your primary site and automatically failing over. You do want to have a human looking after your disaster recovery plan, but you don't want to have a human implementing your disaster recovery plan. There's, a, there's an important distinction there. I know from experience that uh, being an engineer and working on networks, um, all the time when I didn't want to do any work on the network, the network would go down, right? 3 a.m. in the morning, you're sleeping, you're tired, you've had a hard, hard day, and uh, you get a page. I mean, you don't want to be implementing a disaster recovery plan at 3 o'clock in the morning. Okay. So let's talk about warm standby. So you've got a little bit more money that you want to spend, and you want to have a lower RPO and RTO. So you don't want to lose as much data, you don't want to have as much time to uh, recover. So you build an environment similar to your production environment, but you scale it down. Then when there's a DR event, you can scale the, the resources up. Okay, what's the difference between this and a pilot light? Well, basically, a warm standby, we've got a reduced number of instances there, but think of, think of it like the pilot light, the, there's more of a flame in the furnace, so it doesn't take as long for things to heat up. Okay, so you've already got a web server there, you've already got an app server there, you've already got your database server there, they're all running. You could, in this case, you can see we've got a dotted line with Route 53 sending maybe some traffic, maybe um, one in every five requests, for example, to the secondary site, that's possible. So you could run at a reduced performance rate here on, on the secondary site. Now, under a failure, what does that look like? You have auto-scaling groups which are, and cloud, uh, CloudWatch. Who here uses CloudWatch? Yeah? A couple of people? I love CloudWatch. It's, it's awesome. It tells me when things are happening on my instances. When CPU spikes above 80%, you can have an auto-scaling event happen based on a CloudWatch alarm. So in this case, Route 53 detects a failure, transfers all of our um, requests from our users over to the AWS site. CloudWatch detects the um, scale up or the um, increased CPU utilization, for example, and scales out using auto scaling. Okay, so you, you're basically scaling your infrastructure to your demand, right? In that previous slide, I'm just going to jump back there for a second. You're paying for these servers to run, so maybe use some heavy utilization RIs for those. However, when you are scaled out, this may only be for a day until you can get your primary site back up and running again or you may decide to run your secondary site as your primary site now. That's a possibility too. Okay. Um, all right, so moving warm standby to production, we kind of covered that uh, using cloud formation and um, auto scaling, uh, leveraging heavy utilization RIs again, and testing your um, DR strategy. All right, let's talk about multi-site deployment. I'm gonna go a little bit faster here because we are seeing some patterns here. We're seeing some patterns on how to deploy infrastructure in AWS, right? Pilot Light was great. I mean, that was, it blew my mind when I first uh, learned about Pilot Light. Multi-site architecture is pretty straightforward. So basically, you're mirroring your production site on AWS. So let's have a look at what that could look like. So you want to load balance between both your on-premise and your, your um, AWS deployment. If the DR site is isolated or, or has a problem, you switch over to AWS. So you can see here we're mirroring everything. Our web servers, app servers, and database servers all look pretty similar. You've got database synchronization between the two sites. So uh, the two sites are in sync. And you've basically deployed what was like your warm standby, but now it's taking maybe 50% of the load. You do want to build your infrastructure so that it is scaled to 50%. So then when there is a failure, you, you can handle the full 100% of the um, load that you're going to be receiving from your users. Okay, also, another point here, the primary site can be in a physical data center or a customer data center, but it can also be an AWS. What does that look like? 
So we've deployed the same thing here. We've got two regions, region one and region two. I'm not going to specify any particular regions, but we've basically deployed our primary site and our secondary site in AWS in this scenario. Alrighty. I hope uh, that, that was interesting for you guys. I'm now going to invite Ravi up to talk about the Lanyon Passkey example. <laughs> Thanks, Thanks Ravi. Thanks, Matt. Uh, Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, so far, we have discussed about what are the various models we could deploy disaster recovery sites on AWS. Now we'll take a look into one deployment we have done for Lanyon to deploy their large-scale transactional environment, a DR mode on AWS. A brief introduction about uh, Sorry, it's moving fast, okay. Brief introduction about Paskey, Lanyon. Uh, they're the leading uh, group business travel company. They're into both transient and group business travels. Uh, the particular product that we have uh, worked on here is Group Max that helps various hotels to generate more group events. For example, the current reInvent uh, event uh, that you have booked your hotels and all those things, you are actually using this particular product while you are booking your hotels and you are doing your registrations. So not just this event, many events across the world use this particular product to allocate a block of rooms in various hotels in a particular city and get a discounted rates and do all that management. This is the product that supports the backend of that particular platform. As you can see, a lot of demand for that particular requirement because so many users hitting that particular environment, that group max environment, when there is a huge event happening. So this is pretty much critical for Lanyon. And they would like to have a disaster recovery. They already have a disaster recovery, but they want it to be a more scalable and a lot more efficient environment. So when we are beginning, uh, this particular engagement, uh, we try to focus on three particular areas uh, as part of a DR solution. The first one was it has to be highly available and durable so that customers of Group Max and, or Lanyon can get most out of their uh, actual products. Customers are always happy. It has to be available. The high, level, high availability is the main key aspect here. And second thing is it has to be within the time and budget constraints. It should not be cost prohibitive to implement. And when we are trying to implement this particular thing, Lanyon reached out to Apps Associates with two main focus elements here. First one is to build this particular solution to leverage the latest best practices in the industry and also to ensure that it is built on the latest technology platform that is available out there. AWS was the obvious choice, but rather than trying to go to any other partner, they wanted to focus this particular implementation project with a partner who is experienced in both AWS technologies as well as the technology that they are using in-house to build their own products and applications. In our case, it is Oracle. That is one of the core component, uh, the core uh, database layer that they are using so they wanted to have an expertise in both areas so that we could build an efficient system end of the day. Major technical requirements were it has to be lowest possible RTO and RPO within the budget uh, cost constraints we had. And this is one of the key factors. It should be able to handle full production workload in case of failover. And this particular failover scenario it should be able to handle this full production workload for extended periods. Generally, we see disaster recovery modes for maybe a couple of days, maybe weeks. But we would like to have this particular solution usable on the DR side for longer durations. If we would like to do, let's say, on the primary side, we would like to do a data center upgrade, a large, uh, complete refresh of hardware. If we would like to have that extended periods of downtime, maybe a few weeks to a month, even then, this particular platform should support in a fully functional model. That's one of the key requirements as well. And as always, it should be, cost should be minimum, 
and more like a future roadmap. At some point in future, as the company grows with its user base, this solution has to be convertible into an active-active deployment where users can hit both on-prem as well as AWS if the situation arises. When there's a huge load, rather than directing them to only on-prem environment, they should also be able to hit the AWS-based infrastructure in more like an active-active deployment. These were the key requirements. And why did we choose AWS? It was obvious. The first and foremost thing, CapEx versus OpEx, uh, the current footprint, the current infrastructure was pretty heavy. I'll come to that in a minute. To deploy such a large-scale hardware on any other Kohler facility would require a lot of investment. We would like to avoid that. We wanted to go in a more of OpEx model, a lightweight. AWS was the obvious choice. It has to be supporting this elasticity. You know, when the user's load increases, it should be able to handle more users so that it should be easily scalable. And it should make the overall solution agile, and it should make the team to move things quicker. And the team should be able to deploy the overall solution in a lot more quicker way with less time to market. So that's one of the key requirements as well. Let's take a look at the actual solution. What we're deploying here in terms of uh, the current corporate data center, it's not even 1% of what we actually have. It's like a miniature version of our current complexity. The current footprint of production environment, what we are having, is a massive rack cluster for Oracle database. It's a total three databases with more than, cumulative it's more than three and a half terabytes of data and three different databases serving various functions, transactions, reporting, and BA workloads. It's a massive rack cluster of five nodes for transaction, two nodes for BI, and collectively we are talking about approximately 80 plus cores of CPU and more than 500 gigs of RAM. That is the capacity we are talking about. That is the scale of this current uh, production environment. And the application fleet is like almost 30 to 50 uh, servers, depending on the time of the requirement, how we scale up and scale down on-prem. It's a massive environment. To build a DR for this particular solution on AWS, it is not easy if you are trying to do it in a warm standby mode or in an active-active mode. We had to go for pilot light. That was the only option to make sure that we meet the cost constraints. So we built uh, a pilot light DR. Just we took three simple uh, database servers to replicate three databases. We could have done with single server as well, but we had to make a choice between the actual RTO. Or it won't affect RPO, but uh, how much time it will take to bring up in case of disaster. If you have separate servers for database tire, it would be a lot more quicker. So we went ahead with three separate database servers to replicate uh, the current uh, database transactions. On an average, we are talking about 150 gigs of transactions happening every day. That's average. Uh, averages means it's nothing. But when we are talking about peak uh, events that are happening, it could be at least five times more than this uh, average uh, transaction rate. So these particular uh, pilot database servers, they're pretty small. Just to give perspective, we spoke about the current production approximately 80 cores cumulatively. We are talking about three servers running M3.large, which is two cores and seven gigs of RAM, just to replicate the data. We didn't have to provision huge capacity. We, want, we kept monitoring so that if there is huge backlog of transactions, if you feel that that particular two cores are not sufficient, we have options to quickly spin up, increase the capacity on the DR from two cores to four cores, catch up the lag, and come down to two cores. So that's the scale we were able to reduce on pilot rate configuration. It was really cost effective. In case of disaster, we simply spin up more application and uh, web tire servers. We are already using Route 53 for uh, current production workload. So it's already there, even though our production is on-prem, Route 53 is used as DNS service. So when you are trying to switch over, it was a simple switch in Route 53, and it can be automated. That was a simple solution. So the key highlights uh, of our overall solution was the pilot light. This is the main aspect of our overall solution. 
The reason we started this particular project was we could do pilot light only with AWS. It is not possible with any other solution provider out there. So pilot light was the key for our, our solution and we were able to scale up infrastructure whenever it is required. And one of the mo most important aspect of our overall solution was the technology complexity. Uh, we looked, out, looked at multiple options of how we can replicate the transactions. Golden Gate was our choice because it is the cutting edge technology out there. It will support our future roadmap of active active bidirectional synchronization as well. There are other options for synchronizing, uh, synchronizing Oracle workloads, but Oracle Database uh, for Oracle Golden Gate, that was the best option for us. And there is also cross-platform things involved, so we had to go with the particular option. In terms of automation, we had to automate a lot of the work that we have done. We have used CLI heavily to make sure that bootstrapping wherever it is required is done properly. And we are also incorporating cloud formation into the mix so that when we actually hit the disaster scenario, we can bring up additional web tires and application tires as required. The results that we were able to achieve were we were able to ensure that recovery point objective less than 30 minutes. We were able to ensure that transactions are replicated within that time. It's actually more of a, a guidance, but what we have seen during our load test was we were able to replicate transactions, even if we try to do a massive load test. Within five to 10 minutes, we were able to sync up all the transactions, but our guidance was 30 minutes and we were able to reach that. In terms of recovery time objective, as entire infrastructure is already provisioned and shut down, for application fleet and web, uh, web tires, and all the configurations are already done, validated and test route, we're able to bring up everything pretty quickly. Four hours was our RTO guidance, and we were able to achieve that. And uh, we, are use, we are not exactly using auto-scaling feature as such here, but we are using automated scaling using the CLI features, and we were able to bring up uh, uh, services as needed. And this is more of a future requirement for us. Uh, we know that this technology works and we were able to test it and validate it. So in future, we would, when we actually want to do it as a active active and uh, use it, uh, it supports our future roadmap, so that works. So these are the objectives and we were able to achieve that. With that, I'll hand it back to Matt. Thanks, Robbie. Thank you. All right, so. Pilot light does work. I mean, we've got a, a real life example there. Um, pretty awesome stuff. The fact that they're only using three M3 larges, was it, Ravi, for your uh, database or VG? Yeah. I mean, that, that's pretty crazy. So an Oracle rack replicating to three M3 large instances. Pretty crazy. Okay, so um, just to recap here, um, we did talk about disaster recovery and business continuity and how the, the two were interrelated. Um, why AWS for disaster recovery? I mean, that, that should be clear of the features that we do provide for DR um, sites. A couple, we did cover also a couple of the um, architectures that you can have on AWS. So backup and restore, pilot light, warm standby, and multi-site. Just remember, it depends on how much you actually want to spend on your DR and how important it is for RPO and RTO. And we did just talk about the um, customer case study. So where to go next? We have two uh, white papers, and I can't stress enough um, how important the AWS Architecture Center is, and also our uh, white papers. So um, as a solution architect myself, I actually have a milestone every year to produce several white papers. And we generally see things that are happening out in the industry. We talk to a lot of customers, and <clears throat> we see solutions that they're deploying, and we, we see that that could be beneficial for, for you guys. So we produce white papers around that and reference architectures around that. So best practice, reference architectures, white papers, they are all available on the AWS Architecture Center and our white papers site. And the two that are applicable at the moment for backup and disaster recovery is the backup and recovery approaches using AWS and using AWS for uh, disaster recovery. You'll find a lot of the topics that we covered here today are actually in those two white papers as well, just in a little bit more detail. We only had 45 minutes here, unfortunately.
Um, now I do also urge you uh, back 404, disaster, deploying uh, high availability and disaster recovery architectures with AWS is a session that's happening at 4.30 today. We've got about quarter past four now, I think. Um, we're actually going to be doing a live demo over there, or Vikram and Kamala are going to be doing a live demo of a, of a system um, that they've, they've uh, built on AWS. Hopefully the networking part works because that's the part that I built for them. Um, also, um, I'm going to hang around for another 15 minutes out in the hallway here with uh, V. G and Ravi. I've got a couple of AWS beer stickers. Don't be shy. Come and grab a couple. And I'm happy to answer any questions as well. Okay. Thanks very much for attending. Really appreciate it.